In today's show of the Platform Presents podcast, I'm with the CEO and co-founder of GreenPal. Brian Clayton is here with me today, and he is going to be, you know, telling me all about, uh, you know, what this Nashville-based startup has installed for its clients. So he's thinking about growth and a little bit about his journey as a CEO and co-founder. So Brian, welcome to the show. Lucas, thanks for having me on. Great to be here. Appreciate it. Give me that rundown. What is GreenPal all about? Yeah, so Green Pal in one sentence is like the Uber, but for lawn mowing. So if a homeowner needs to get their grass cut rather than calling around on Craigslist, they just download Green Pal. They get hooked up with a great lawn mowing service in a matter of minutes. Been at this company for nine years. We're a nine year overnight success. Uh, started off in Nashville, Tennessee, very humbly uh, figuring out the product, getting the marketplace going. And now we're nationwide throughout the entire United States. Uh, over 200,000 people using the app, doing multiple eight figures a year in revenue, and all self-funded. Uh, we have self-funded the business off, off of its own revenues the whole way. So uh, it's been a hell of a journey, but now we, we've got a good marketplace going. Very cool. I like how you say it's a, a nine-year overnight success. So it took some work to get to this result, it sounds. <laughs> Absolutely. still feels like day one, but uh, yeah, it's taken damn near a decade to, to get the company going. Very good. Um, I mean, describe us your, your clients a little bit. I mean, I can obviously sort of think about it a bit, but is there, you know, is that everybody? Is that um, particular sort of personas? Is that maybe even some B2B clients leveraging the platform? Maybe tell us about that. Great question. So that's one of the things like the first couple of years, we're trying to figure that out. Who was this the best fit for? Who, who was the best use case? And so we really have two customers. We're a multiple, multi-sided marketplace. So we have buyers and sellers that we're connecting. And so on the one side, we have homeowners or, or people renting a home that need a basic lawn mowing service. And we had to figure out who they were and where to reach them. And on the other side, we have lawn mowing professionals, people that make a living cutting grass. And so what do they look like? And so it took a, took a while to figure that out. And for the service provider side, it's actually your small solo operators. You're, you're Chuck in a truck, Peter in a pickup, or, or Molly in a mower. We have a lot of female business owners that use the platform too. And so you, typically people that you know are working a full-time job but want to get into business for themselves, we're a great way for them to kind of like bridge that gap. And so if you, it's the best way in the world is to make an extra thousand dollars a week is in the lawn mowing business. And so that's really who we have the, the sweet spot with on the on the supplier side. On the homeowner side, it's it's more of your working class families. It's dual income uh, working class folks that understand that by the time they go buy a lawn mower and mow their own yard, they can pay somebody on Green Pal to do it cheaper. Uh, than they could do it for, for themselves. When we first started, we thought we were going after like the super high end people who wanted private gardeners and things of that sort. But as time went on, we realized that our value proposition was really strongest with people who just wanted the basic services done, but weren't necessarily getting a good, a good experience out in the analog world. And that's who we solve for. Yep, makes a whole lot of sense. And now with, that you're saying it, it sounds so simple, but it's a lot of work to get to those insights. Really good. <laughs> Um, awesome. So tell us a little bit about the website. What role does the website play today? Um, do people go there in order? Is it, do they go to the app? Like maybe tell us a little bit about the relationship of the website and the app. Yes. So to your point, it is a, it is a web-based platform and also uh, four mobile apps to um, uh, Android and iOS for homeowners, Android and iOS for, for vendors. And so we kind of have to be good everywhere. And so what we experience is that people discover Green Pal on the web. Uh, they need a lawn mowing service. So they'll go to Google and they'll say, uh, look, lawn mowing service, uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. And they'll find our page uh, as one of the options they can look at. And they'll onboard through the web and then they'll get set up, they'll get quotes, and then they hire who they want to work with. And then as time goes, goes on, they, they see our little... Uh, messaging to push them for the mobile app and then they use the mobile app from there uh we've tried like hell to get discovery through the mobile app stores but the reality is people just don't ser search for these sorts of things from like the play store or the app store they go to google or or they just do a, a simple search or even facebook we get a lot of traffic from social and that's kind of the typical kind of journey that from a new customer to a retained user they discover on the web and they retain on the mobile app Got you. Very good. Uh, let's talk about the website then a little bit, because it seems like the entry door for, for a lot of the folks. Um, what do you currently think is the strength versus of the page versus where do you think still there's still room for improvement in order to you know get even more people to sign up? 
Yeah. So for us, the biggest, uh, the biggest th the challenge we have is the status quo. People still do this the old way. Uh, they still don't know that, Hey, you can just download an app and get this done in minutes rather than calling around all day and getting stood up and waiting for quotes. So that's our, that's our biggest competition is the status quo, getting the product in more hands of more people. Um, when you come to the website, we've, we've reduced, removed all the friction that we can to make it as easy as, is it possible to get quotes? You just pop your name, address, and uh, email address and then you get free quotes you don't even have to set up an account after you get the quotes you can look at them and then you can see then you can hire the person you want to work with set, set up your uh, credit card and password and you're off and going we've really spent a long time searching for that that friction and removing and reducing as much of it as we can and there's always room for improvement uh particularly with copy we're always a b testing copy we're always trying to figure out uh, ways to communicate the value and the ease of use with as few words as, as possible. And that's a never ending process. You're always trying to figure out uh, how to get into the head of your user and close the gap between company logic and customer logic. And a lot of that just comes from, from testing, from, you know, uh, some tactics we have is we read reviews uh, that people post about our company and the language they use. And, you know, do they call it a yard care contractor or a lawn cutting service or a grass cutting service or a lawn mower or a landscaper or a lawn guy or a grass guy? How do they talk about this kind of thing? So it's a never ending optimization process, always trying to like, like clarity trumps persuasion and always trying to make it clear and clear and clear. I think that will be the quote for the interview. Clarity trumps persuasion. I really like that. Very cool. Makes yeah. a lot of sense. Awesome. Um, okay, I see. Um, would you be yourself even somebody who's like deep diving into the metrics and you know look at conversions or how how you guys are set up there? Is there a team in place for this? How you sort of you know keep track of what's actually happening on the web page? So everything that the the company uh, does, whether it be designing, writing code data, conversion rate optimization, copy, customer service, I have done personally at some point or another. You know, in, in the early days, it was me and my co-founders doing all the work, matter of fact, for about four years. Mm -hmm. And as time went on, we started getting a little bit of revenue flowing and we started uh, getting a little bit of traction. We would reinvest those dollars where we needed the most help. And a lot, for many years, that was just developers. We needed more help with, with writing code. And so uh, I think it's you can't really delegate anything until you've done a little bit of it yourself. And so now we've, we've got a good team around me and, and my co-founders all in were somewhere between 35 and 40. This depends on, on the time of year. And uh, so now we have a full-time data, data scientist. We have full-time CRO guy. We have like a SEO team that's four or five deep. And all of these folks are working together with me uh, in terms, okay, where are we at? Where are we trying to go in? What's, what's working? What's not? What, what initiatives are, are we doing? And, and so I'm kind of leading that kind of growth team uh, so very much in the trenches, in the weeds of understanding, okay, wh where, what do our SEO initiatives look like? What do our CRO initiatives look like? And how do those blend together? Because more and more these days they do. And, and bringing those kind of talents together and, and like, like removing the log jams and driving us towards like the goal that we're working on that, that week or month is kind of my role today. Gotcha. But it started, it started off eight years ago in optimizely trying to set this crap up myself and stuff, you know, very much like I've done a lot of it myself for many years. Very cool. Yeah, we'll get to that in a second. I'm curious, like, um, I mean, with your experience of optimizing conversions, like what have you found to be the biggest challenge actually in figuring out why people don't convert? I have found that there are no expert marketers. It's only expert testers. So many damn things that I thought were true have been proven wrong and things that I thought were silly have been proven right. And, you know, you just don't really like there's this always going to be this gap between customer logic and company logic. And it's up to you as the founder to try to close that gap as much as you can. And, and the only way to close it is to talk to your users, talk to your customers, do stuff like read online reviews about what they're saying, and then, and then let that form the hypothesis for testing. And then test, 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 test. I, I mean, as much as like I would love to like give better advice than that, after a decade of doing this, that's, that's the only thing I have found that has worked because there's so many things that, that I thought were true that just were proven wrong. And the only way that to understand is let the data speak. Now, in the early days, 
you don't have the you don't have the traffic to do all this testing. So you kind of do have to go with with your gut call on a lot of these things, but you can let that gut call be influenced with conversations from however many users you have. If you've got 12 users, you need to be talking to all 12. If you've got 100 users, you need to be talking to as many of them as you can, because that will inform kind of the heuristics and the and the gut call and the, and the, and the gut feeling that you have that'll get you through the first few years because you don't have the data to test. Sure, you can do some data, you can do some testing in the channel, maybe with emails and maybe with Google AdWords to kind of get a sense for, for copy and value proposition. But a lot of the times, man, uh, I see this, I see this a lot with new founders, you know, they got no traffic to the site and they're setting up tons of A-B testing. And I'm like, you don't need, you don't need two or 3% gains. You need an order of magnitude, more traffic. So go spend time over there. So it's, it's always dynamic. It's always fluid. But as, as time goes on, you really got to test because you just don't know. I've been proven wrong so many times. I mean, you mentioned tests. Um, I would be curious with all your experience and years of you know being really in the trenches there, what would you have needed in terms of like, you know, was it difficult to actually do the bridge from I'm doing the test to I know what I need to change? Maybe tell us a little bit about that. It was a theme on the show recently, right? You're people looking at heat maps and still not really know yet what to do or they look at an A-B test and yeah, one is winning, but they're still not necessarily sure how really to improve website conversions overall. Like what's been your, you know, what's been your experiences with that? For me, a, a great entry point. So you can, you can do this one or two ways. You can do radical testing. Uh, I mean, just, and, and, and some people will tell you, yeah, you, need, you need to do completely radical testing with how you are presenting treatment A versus treatment B. And then you get down into a, 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 a from a global to a local maxima. Um, I've tried that and I've had some success, but I've also had some great wins with, with just small testing like copy. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, just small things like, like changing the copy from uh, get, get long care now to long care comma fast have increased like total signups by like 15%, just the headline. Mm -hmm. So I think the point is, is you, you need to, it almost doesn't matter, like, but you need to go all in on, on one strategy and just execute for a while rather than just like theorizing, hypothesizing and not doing anything like, like do a drastic test, like a completely different treatment. What did I learn from that? Or just start with copy and start testing that. Uh, Cause most of the time, most of the time nobody's testing or they're testing too soon or they're, or, or they're testing stuff like button color and stuff. Like my advice would be start, start with copy, uh, test the hell out of that. And then, and then do some, some, some radical uh, changes like test this, this style versus this style and, and just try to do four or five tests at a time. You know, when you're at my level, you know, doing, you know, I mean, we've got a hundred thousand people coming to the site a month. We've got a, uh, you know, 75,000 to 100,000 people using that, the, the product on a regular basis, uh, multiple eight figures a year in revenue. So we're not small, but we're not like billions. I think when you're at my size, you need to have like five to 10 tests going on at all times and, and at different stages of the, of the funnel, like at the, at the acquisition, at the activation, at the retention, at the revenue, like at different stages, and just do one or two tests at every stage of the funnel at all times. And, and let these things build on each other, like let them build from, from, from like what, what your hypothesis is to what, what you're trying to understand is my advice. And, and, and this is a guy that, that is like at this stage of the game. Once you get to like hundred nine figure and billion dollars, you need you need, you need to have like more of a, a robust strategy. But the reality is, most people at my level aren't doing testing, or they're doing it completely wrong. Um, and 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 the reality is, is that you can make meaningful impact in the business by by just doing a handful of tests and 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 let those hypotheses come from what the customer is telling you. Um, let it come from their conversations you're having from, from customers and then theorize, okay, what if it was like this or what if it was like that? And then test, that's what's worked for me. And, uh, and that'll probably get me to the next level of the game. Very cool. Super interesting. Uh, let's switch gears. Um, since we're slowly approaching already the end of the interview, I want to hear a little bit about yourself. Um, uh, you mentioned, um, you guys have been in it, uh, for a couple of years. Um, maybe tell us like specifically one advice for other founders from the first couple of years um, that was carrying you through something that you've learned, you know, something that you might would be doing different. You know, I'm asking basically for the time until success was hitting, like, you know, what, what was sort of the key learnings if you would have to summarize them? 
yeah it's 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 a it's like entrepreneurship is full of paradoxes it's like it's like you you have to have this huge goal but you also have to think and act very very small so when we were first getting rolling like we didn't have an seo strategy stood up we didn't have a, a, an authoritative domain we needed like 100 people to use the damn app so we passed out door flyers that was the first thing we did. And then we met with as many of those people as it would meet with us to talk to them about what their experience was. And then we let that drive us to the next level. So I, my advice would be like, start small, act small, be relentless about executing small and look at it almost like a video game. Just get through one level at a time. Don't get overwhelmed with what's my multivariant testing strategy going to be because that stuff doesn't matter to you at level one, two, and three. Really just try to get people in the funnel and learn from their activity and let that up and apply those learnings to get you to the next level of the game. Do that over and over again, over a longer period of time, it compounds. So be relentless about these things, understand that it takes time, but on the other hand, don't just sit there doing fake work for four years and expect sex success to just manifest. Um, I see that a lot too. Like this whole trust the process, just trust the process, bro. And it's like, it's like, no, like you can't just sit there and incubate for four years and not do anything. And then like you have a success, successful company. That's not how it works. You have to really grind on the small things for a very long period of time. And then it compounds and builds up. And then you start worrying about things like multivariate testing. Once you've got maybe 20,000 people coming through the funnel every month and, and, and then you've graduated that level of the game. But the reality is most of the time people want to skip levels one, two, and three. They don't want to do the hustle. They don't want to do the grind. And they're, and they're screwing around with, 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 with multivariate testing it doesn't matter at that level so it's like delineating these things from like 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 levels and working your way through the levels i don't hear talked about a lot and that's been how it's been my experience building this company from scratch yeah it's super interesting because all the content that you read is very hard to actually place into which level what you're just reading right now actually belongs versus where you're at right now super that's right yeah no, no nobody's laid it out like that and and yeah you need to be consuming these advanced levels of content but I see this all the time. It's like we pop up Google, Google, Google Analytics. It's like I do some mentoring and, and advising for entrepreneurs as a hobby and for free. Mm -hmm. And it's like, bro, you got you had like 300 people come to the site last last month. Like <laughs> we need more traffic. Like you need to be banging out blog posts, good ones about stuff nobody's talking about, about your niche. We need to get some traffic. And, and then we can learn from that. We don't need to be doing this. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's just that's just how how I see it. Nobody, and like a lot of times nobody wants to go through that because it's not fun. Nobody wants to like get on the phone with their customers and talk to them. Nobody wants to meet their customer at Starbucks and talk to them. Nobody wants to like put their cell phone number on the transactional email so they get calls and texts. But you need to be able to do that in the early days to get to get to those first few levels. And 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 it's kind of table stakes. Yeah, makes a whole lot of sense. I want to wrap it up with some rapid fire questions. Are you ready for those? Let's do it. What's the last book you read? Uh, last book I read was, so I'm, I'm reading a book right now on, on an M&A uh, because we've had a lot of inbound interest on M&A. It's called uh, M&A from the mid-level trenches. Um, so that's not, a, that's not a real applicable one. And then the one I read before that was a book on stoicism um that a buddy recommended that was really tough and then the one i read about uh one i read before that was a one from by robert Childani called persuasion which is really good um always reading I'll try to read a book a month very cool what's the one thing your company's focused on the most at the moment um what we're focused on and, and have been and probably will be is more traffic more traffic more traffic more traffic we need more top of the funnel traffic how do we get more traffic <laughs> it's, it's like it's it's like we yeah we have to be the best in the world at, at like push a button get the grass cut but we also have to be the best in the world at organic seo it's kind of funny like you do all these things that have no relation to your business whatsoever but you have to do them to 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 to, to get the distribution and so that's like the one of the core competencies of our business is organic SEO. And so that's one thing that we're focusing on. If there would be no boundaries in tech, what's the one thing you would fix for your role today? No, no boundaries in tech. Everything is possible. What would you fix for your role? Uh, along the same lines as, as, as the last thing, if I could wave a magic wand uh, and get and just, just like turn on more distribution 
Mm -hmm. uh with that without a billion dollar budget uh we could rule the world like because we're not dominant we're not constrained by the the ability of what our product can do we're constrained by our distribution and and so like uh, and that's a lot that's the big thing with a lot of startups they're not killed because their product sucked they're killed because they didn't innovate on distribution and uh and so that's that's the bottleneck for us it's like more distribution um so yeah wave a magic wand i would like be best friends with with uh with larry page and and just get more traffic very good very last question would be if today would be your very first day you're starting uh green Paul, what's the one advice you would give yourself oh man well i could probably I, I, I take, it's taken me a decade to get here i could save five years at least um spend less time on things that don't matter it's 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 like you're caught up in, you don't know what the hell you're doing the first two or three years and that's just the reality and uh so a lot of times you get caught up in this fake work when it's really the, the reality is there's only two or three things you need to be throwing all your weight into so that would be one piece of advice and then like the other thing is once you have those two or three things figured out like like try to delineate that into ways you can delegate uh tasks so you can move quicker uh because for like three years my co-founders and i did everything we had no help and then as time went on we, we figured out, okay we can get a, we can get a va to help with this we can get a contractor to help with that i would have closed that gap from three years to three months that makes a lot of sense maybe because you brought up the concept of fake work uh two times i want to just like step into that one more time how do you detect fake work if you're doing it like what's <laughs> what's yeah. a good way to step back and reflect on it for you personally what have you found Yeah, you you really got to just figure out what the goal is. What is the goal for that month? What are we trying to do? So it's like we have 100 customers. We need 500. And so that's the output metric. And then you focus on the input metrics. What are the things we got to do to get 500 customers? And there, and let's keep it below 10 and maybe is maybe only five. And then do those five things. And a lot of times, what's my brand strategy what's the culture look like uh what kind of content are we putting on instagram if that's not a channel for us don't go in, are not going to be those five things and so a lot of those things are fake work and uh you know once you're pumping you know multi-millions in revenue and you can do some of these these things but like in the early days man you can get bogged down in fake work for years that's not moving the needle it's not driving the business from one level to the next And so spend less time on things that don't matter and, and like kill all the fake work. And the reality is those five things, you don't want to do them. Nobody wants to like research and write really great content. Like no, nobody wants to like go in and, and look at Google analytics and figure out where people are coming from and figure out where the funnel's leaking. Like that stuff's not fun, mm -hmm. but it, you know, you got to do it if you, if you want to pro progress to the next level. Awesome. Brian, I think you, you know, brought a whole lot of value to the conversation. I think you shared with us the, the story of Green Paul. So, um, you know, hope a couple of, uh, you know, people out there listening should be heading over. People who are doing fake work, maybe they should at least get somebody else doing the lawn mowing for them. So That's, that's, right. that's right. Life's too short to cut your own grass. Let, let, let the pros handle it. Very cool. So I want to give you the last word, right? If everybody, somebody would be forgetting all that we discussed today, what's the one thing that they should remember about Green Paul? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I'll, I'll give you one, one last, one, one last little thing that's top of mind right now. I listened to an interview with uh, Mark Andreessen, the guy who invented the modern web browser, and he's talking about when he went to Silicon Valley in 1993, and he's talking about when he got out there, he, and he really felt this. He felt like, I missed it. I'm too late. It's all over. All the great computing companies were built in the 70s. They dominated in the 80s. Apple, IBM, Microsoft, they own everything. And I miss it. It's over. He really felt that. And how comical that is, like this dude invented the, the web browser. It was the beginning of the internet. Everything came after that. And I have felt this way a few times in, in business. Like, I'm too late to the game. I missed it. And so entrepreneurs probably feel that way too. It's like, oh, I missed cloud or I missed crypto or I missed on demand or I missed uh, whatever the trend is, you know? And like, the reality is it always gets bigger. It always will be bigger. It's always going to be bigger. You did not miss it. It's just the beginning. And so like, that's the last thought I'll, I'll leave everybody with. And then anybody wants to hit me up, you can hit me up on Instagram. That's where I hang out the most. It's at Brian M. Clayton. Thanks a lot for being a guest on Pathfinder Presents. Thanks, Lucas. Appreciate it.